Good afternoon, Facebook, Steve Woody from Online Mastery and today's Midday Mastery is episode 25. 25 episodes, I can't believe it's Friday. Happy Friday everyone, I'll be looking forward to the weekend. So this today is going to be about design, we're going to talk about design and just really simply how you show up and what you do and how you do it. Because there are a lot of people out there that want to start but are scared because of the way they look. Um, There are a lot of people out there that want to... Um, change the market and the perception that people have of them um, but they don't know how to and there's a lot of people out there who are going through a lot of different situations I've noticed and I'm hoping that this just gives you a really basic overview okay this is nothing too intense or anything I'm really looking forward to getting back into some sort of deeper level strategies but the way that I'm thinking of doing it is more like um, I might create like a free members area and just do the Facebook lives and then push people into a members area where I'll put a lot more content in. So hopefully today you'll like this. This will be really sort of useful if you're looking at design and some things you need to consider. So only going to be about 10, 15 minutes. Um, then I will be, I'm just going to flip the camera around so you can see it. Um, but yeah, we're going to talk about design. So there's some things that I've learned. And by the way, look, I fixed up today for you. Wanted to look the part. Um, it's really interesting. So yesterday, I actually um, I spent most of the day in an Uber yesterday, going back and forth, um, meeting clients and having interviews and meetings. And so I had breakfast in the morning, met a client, and then went to another client. I like, met a new client, then went to an existing client, and then I had to jump uh, on a call whilst I was on the DLR to another potential new client to go and meet another client to spend the afternoon. And what I realized is that because I was moving around so much, I wanted to feel comfortable. And so, you know, I put some jeans on, I had like a a jumper on uh, and my scarf, but I wasn't really, I didn't like make a big effort on how I looked, you know. I was considering, because one of my new clients, um, well, he's a a friend of his, has an amazing beard, like a proper man beard. And I was, uh, I'm so jealous of it. Like we went out for a drink the other night and I was just staring at his beard and I was just like, I love that beard. I want to grow like a really decent, like Spartan warrior beard. And then I sort of tried it for a few days and I was like, actually, do you know what? I don't know, because I've got to go through this process of how I look. And that's and it got me thinking because it is a process, right? If I want to get the way that I want to get, if I want to look the way I want to look, then I have to go through a process to get there. And your brand and your business is no different. Like when you start, here and when you sort of get to here this journey you will go through iterations you will do things that look good and you will do things that look bad and you will do things that look good and things that look bad and that just that's that happens that's the journey that we go on now most people entrepreneurs business owners people who are starting out don't necessarily have the budget at the start to hire in a design agency because you need the first thing you need when you're talking about design is you need to look at your brand that's the, that's, that's the first key point. You need to know your brand. Once you know your brand, then you need to start looking at you know, the design. How, how your brand guidelines match your design around your brand. Then you need to start looking at your voice. You know How you're articulating your message, how you sound, how you put yourself out there, how you appeal to other people. And, so there's a lot of, and then you need someone who can create. So then you actually need the designer. So you need like a graphic designer, you need like a, you know, there's like different types of people. So when you look at design itself, there's, there's different people who work within design. It's not just, oh, I need a designer. You know, you've got, there's, there's different people, different types of designers. And so most people don't have a budget when they start to bring in an agency who have all of the different creatives that you need um, to get out there. So to not overwhelm you and to keep it really simple, what I want to focus on is when you're getting started. Let's just start at the, get to the start point and you can catch up wherever you are on the journey. When you start out, the most important thing that you need, you must know your brand guidelines. You have to know your brand guidelines. And it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, you can speak to Mark Hare. He's got a website called uh, Smart Online Design. And he actually talks you through how to create brand guidelines in a day. So it's like a one-day workshop. You create your brand guidelines. Now... They don't have to be perfect. The thing is, any designer that you speak to, and let's just break this down very quickly. I want you to sort of understand this. Um, Because if you understand where I sit, this is not like an Illuminati or anything. This is me, all right? This is going to be a designer. This is going to be a developer. And this is going to be the business owner. Okay? And then, so when you consider that you've got three different types of people, 
designer, developer, business owner. And normally they don't talk to each other. Like a designer and a developer are so far apart that this person wants it to look good and this person wants it to work. And so making something look good and making it functional are two totally different things. So one of them is creative, one of them is logical. They look at things differently. So when you say I need a website, you need to understand that the first thing you need to do is you need to get a designer to look at the aesthetics and the branding point of view and a developer to work on the functionality. That's why I sit in the middle because I understand both and I can talk to both and I know both. And so I can relate back to you because you probably don't know either. You might know a bit about design, you might know a bit about development. You might know how to you know, do a little bit here and there and you may know how to do a little bit here and there, but the idea is you need a master in this area. Somebody who can take your brand and can give you a set of brand guidelines. And what do I mean by brand guidelines? It's really, really simple. And there are a lot of people that can talk about this. You know, for a long time I've said I'm not very good at design and it was always a big thing when I said I'm not a designer. And the reality is you don't have to be a designer, you just have to have a creative uh, mindset. So when you're looking at the design, the first thing that you really want to consider is going to be obviously you need a logo. Now, if you haven't got a logo, that's fine because without a logo, uh, you can just use, there's different types of logos. And I'm not going to go too deep into it. Just read my book. It's all in there. In the, um, the concept of a logo, you can have like a logo type, you can have a logo font. There's like different, you know, are you going to have a square? Are you going to have a, a rectangle? Like there's different things you can consider when you're looking at a logo. And if you don't have a logo, you can just look. Some of the logos, and I, I put a post up about this recently, like you look at the BBC, it's three letters in a box. That's their logo. Right? It's not rocket science. When you look at BP, British Petroleum, do you know how much BP paid for their logo? It's like $122 million. $122 million, I think. It's like insane. It was insane how much they paid for their logo. But I understand. Because... You might want to uh, get something up there and you might think, oh, I need a logo. And so one of the first things people say is, oh, I don't really want to spend a lot of money on my logo. I'm going to go to something like Fiverr.com and I'm going to get someone who's paid less than a peanut to create my brand identity for me. Because the logo is a starting point. And whilst you may not have one and you may get started with just your name or just some text, you really need to consider that one of the first things you need to do before you do anything else is get a logo because your logo is how you're represented. It's how you're put out there. It's how you're positioned. See, my logo is really, really simple. When you look at online mastery, it's just, you, you may look at it and just think it's this. But the whole idea is this is plan, build, promote. The different colours. The blue in the plan is all about strategy. It's a blueprint. It's all about creating that foundation. The green in build is all about building. It's growth. It's nurture. It's all about... Uh, that side of things. And the pink, which is like Soho on a Friday night, is like promote. You, look at me. So the plan, build, promote, the three colours, they have meaning. Now, it wasn't until we designed this logo, and I basically just said to my designer at the time, a guy called Mark Doyle, great guy, and I paid him about a £1,000, just under, for my logo. And it was the day that I spent with him. It was his knowledge to be able to ask me certain questions and to be able to put things together in a way that I could understand them. Because all I did is I turned around to him and said, look, my company's online mastery, I want to focus on three things, I'm not sure what they are, but I want to use the Google Dots. I like the idea of the Google Dots. And that's where we come up with plan, build, promote. So simply having that conversation with a designer, him showing me all the concepts, me working through and saying, actually, I don't like that, I don't like that, I don't like that, I like that, and giving me like all of the boards for me to look at and all of the things, when we got to that point, and I was like, that's it. I don't know if you've noticed this last six months, this last eight months since I've had my rebrand. Now I've got my books are out there, all of my promotional materials out there, I've got all of my pens, I've got everything that I do now. Everything's branded up because I'm really confident and I love my brand. You've got to love your brand. So whatever you create, you've got to love it. You can't just put something and go, I haven't got no money, so I'm going to just put something crap and cheap out there and, oh yeah, it's just me getting myself. Because like, it's a touch point. Like my business cards, all my business cards have on them, and I haven't got any here, unfortunately. It says Steve Woody on one side, and when you turn it over, it says Online Mastery. Because it's a touch point. It's a statement that when people see it, they go, oh, how do I contact you? And I say, well, if I'm not top of Google, I'm not doing my job. All right, so it's a bit of a talking point, but the idea behind it is that when people connect, whether it's through a business card, whether it's online, whether it's through a client, however it is, I want people to have a good experience. I want people, when they think of me, like the, my brand... The perception that because all, all a brand is, is a perception. It's a perception that the marketplace has of you. Like, for example, when you look at Virgin and you look at their brand in terms of their airline, their brand is very different to someone like Ryanair or even 
British Airways, you look at BA. So you've got BA who are really focused, their brand is very corporate, it's very business, and you look at Virgin and it's much more uh, fun, relaxed, entrepreneur, small business owner. So you can totally see the difference between um, the branding of Virgin and the branding of BA. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is that your logo and your brand that you start with needs to represent how you want to be perceived, not as yourself necessarily, but as a business, as an entity, as a corporate, as whatever it is, because remember, we've got a business here, products and services. How do you want to be perceived? Do you want to be trustworthy? Do you want to be loyal? Do you want to be edgy? Do you want to be fun? Like, what are the things that you, because that, that has to relate, because if your logo is off point, then everything you do underneath that, it's just not going to resonate. See, I wanted something that was colourful, vibrant, fun, something that represented me as a person, but also that was serious, that could be taken as a business that was trustworthy and that people could um, have confidence and faith in. You know, these were all important things because two of my biggest values in business, when I, when I look at what, like how I brand myself, I want to give people clarity. I want to make it super simple. That's why everything I do is in freeze. I do it in freeze, plan, build, promote, A, B, C, high, middle, low. It's like everything is in freeze. Because it's easy, it's simple. And the reason I want it to be simple is because I want to give people the confidence. When people understand things, then they're confident. They're confident, they understand it, they can take action. So I need people to take action, because that's one of the biggest things that hold people back. And I need people to be confident and clear on what they're taking action on. Okay, so that's the whole reason that my brand is what it is and how I'm moving it forward. So you need to have a logo. It's really, really important that you get that right. And don't just settle for some cheap crap that's not going to serve you. Now, if you just need to get something out there, proof of concept... I, I understand that, I get that. But when people come to me and say I need a website, I've got a thousand pound budget, I normally say you need to spend about 750 pounds of that on design, on your logo, on your brand. Like three quarters of whatever you're investing, at least between like any client that comes to me, 50% of the budget goes on design and goes on the outward market and goes on how it looks and the content and that side of things. So that's really important. Once you've got your logo, I digress. We move on to the next point. You need to have a basic colour palette. So I... I, I Appreciate uh, if some of you are uh, American and, 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 you, and you might not know how to spell colour. It does have a U in it. Um, ironically, I did put a U in the wrong place when I wrote that down. But colour palette. Colour palette, really, really simple. Now, you can get really in-depth with this and there's some great websites that you can go to. Um, but what I would suggest is to get started, basic level, colour palette. Three colours. Really simple, okay? So the first thing that you need is what is called a primary colour. What is your main primary colour going to be? So this is the colour that is used predominantly throughout your brand. So, you know, when you look at Ryanair, you imagine blue. When you look at Virgin, you imagine red. You know, when you look at BA, you imagine like that corporate blue. Um, BP, you imagine green. So when you see these brands, you imagine these colours. Now, I've had conversations with designers in the past, and it's really interesting where some of them will say, oh, you know, um, what do you, like, how do you want to be perceived? Like, if, if you want to be seen as trustworthy, then you need to be this colour. And if you need to be seen as uh, wealthy, you need to be this colour. The reality is it doesn't fucking matter. Because you're whatever colour, you know, you want to be. If everybody in your industry is blue, then be red. Because you'll stand out. You'll be different from the crowd. So I kind of see the argument on both sides. The answer is, reality is, doesn't really matter. What I would say, and what is important, is... I have a font and colour palette issue. Red, I hope you can see someone to get that sorted, my friend. A little bit of cream on that, you'll be fine in the morning. What I would recommend though, and this is really important you sort of listen to this, because the only thing that really matters on a colour palette, I would say, is the tone. Like, I, There's a lot of other things, and people will argue about this, but as long as you get the tone right. For example, if your target market, let's just say that you are dealing with people who are very stressed and overwhelmed and frustrated, and people who are... Um, reclusive inside themselves and they've got a problem and they're like, you know, you, you may want to attract people with warm, soft colours, sort of pastel tones, things that are sort of nurturing and loving and kind and warm. You probably don't want to come out with this luminous yellow and like hot pink and, and, and this bright fluorescent green. Like they may not be the colours that you want to use if you're trying to attract a softer light. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for like tie dye for a funeral director. I mean, maybe in some instances, but you know, generally, you've got to try and understand your marketplace, what it is you're trying to put across, and the message you're trying to put across. So the idea here is that you have 
your main color, and then you have what's called a supporting color. So whatever your main and supporting color is, they should kind of complement each other. They should, if you just type into Google color wheel, type in color wheel into Google, and you'll see, you'll get an idea of a color wheel. In fact, right, if you do that, you'll get a really good idea. What you want to do is try and pick two colors that are kind of next to each other as a starting point. Then, this is, this is what's important. You have a third color, and your third color is your call to action color. It stands out. Now, the reason we do this is because if you imagine this is a page, and on your page you've got some green here and some green here, and there's a bit of green here, and then all of a sudden you've got a button which is red. You see how it stands out? Can you see on that page how that button stands out? It draws your eye. It's different to everything else. So the idea here is that whilst you may have some colour throughout your site, your call to action colour is different. It's the bipolar opposite to your primary um, colours. And the reason that we do that is so that when you're doing this and this page looks like this, and it all looks good, that red stands out and it draws people's attention because that's what you want people to do. You want people to click. We want them to take action. And so on a website, from a website perspective, we need them to do something. Now, this is also important because yesterday, um, one of the clients I was with, a lady called Roberta Style Lee, check her out. She's got, in fact, go onto Instagram and type in Roberta Style Lee and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So Roberta has, she's a stylist in London, um, very, very good. That's one of the reasons why I maybe had to fix up today. Maybe she's had an impact, who knows. Um, but the, the point is how you show up and how you position yourself, it, it, it determines like what you get in return. You know, if I turned up to a client meeting where I wanted to work with a client and I'm sitting, like, I've, got a board, I've got a boardroom meeting on Monday. If I walk into a boardroom and I'm wearing like my DCs with a pair of jeans and I've got a t-shirt on and I'm just like, fuck it, then... I'm not going to be taken at the same level as if I walk in there and I've got a suit on. So sometimes, you know, and I'm not saying I always want to wear a suit, but sometimes I have to sort of blend into the marketplace with whatever they want or whatever they expect. Because, I mean, I could be like what the Gary Vaynerchuk's do and just be like, fuck it, I'm dressing how I dress. Even sometimes Gary wears a suit. There are times, you know, I know he's always dressed down and he's got his image that he's trying to portray, but there are times when he has to dress up. And there's times when everyone does. So it's... It's just about knowing what's comfortable, what resonates for you. If you always want to be seen like my friend Derry, Derry is always like, I've never seen, I think he sleeps in a three piece. I've never seen him in anything other than a three piece suit. Always. Never ever seen him in anything else. He's sharp, he's got amazing sideburns, he's always really well presented, and that's his image, that's how he projects himself. But then he works with really, really large corporate clients, and he wants to be seen in that way. And I know other people who will turn up, they'll come around to your house and they'll be wearing jogging bottoms and a t-shirt and they'll, but the thing is, if the content's there, if they're giving you the outcome, doesn't matter. Corinne say that clothes can give you wings. Corinne say that clothes can give you wings. I love that. That's a really good saying. But here's the other thing as well, because I can flip it on the other side of it. Like you look at Mark Zuckerberg and you look at Bill Gates and you look at those people who wear the same t-shirt and the same trousers every single day. It's just like, I, I imagine like when they get up in the morning, they open up their their en suite because I can imagine like that they've got a spare room they haven't just got a wardrobe right I can't imagine Mark Zuckerberg with like an Ikea hanger but what I can imagine is that when he opens up his why well, I don't know why I'm opening his wardrobe with two doors I'm imagining he's probably quite large um, but I imagine he's like Homer Simpson and everything's like you know the same um, but some people are like that right it's, it gives you more time to focus on other things you've got to do what works for you you've still got to be you there's no point trying to be someone else because you know we won't be happy you've got to be you but at the same time, your audience has to resonate with you. So you need to understand who you want to work with, who you're going to help, and resonate with them. So you build up your image. Some people will like you, some people won't. There is nothing wrong with polarising an audience. Nothing wrong with that at all. But you do need to understand that if you want to resonate with your audience, if you want to actually land with them, then you need to understand them and you need to make sure that your colour palette, your logo, and everything that you do for your design fits into that. And then third and final thing I'm going to talk about, really, really simple. Hello, Gail. Nice to see you. Uh, third and final point. So we've covered logo. We've covered color palette. Last thing is typography. Typography, your fonts. A lot of people get this wrong. And I know, I know you mentioned this, but one of the things you really need to consider is a font can make every bit of difference. 
you know, just a simple bit of kerning, like the spacing in the lettering, the line height, the font that you use, the way it's used, just that, the, the simple, like, context of using the right font in the right place can have absolute immediate impact. Specifically now, we're in a very visual world. Instagram, Snapchat, Pinterest, you look at all of the things out there which are very, like, um, you look at memes, you look at anything like that, people... They instantly read, they instantly judge, they instantly make an opinion, and so the type of font that you use will have a massive impact. So when you can get your fonts right, and I'm not gonna, there's so many different types of fonts, I'm not even gonna go into it, I don't even know that much about it, but what I do know from the people I've spoken to is that fonts matter and you really need to make sure that you nail your logo, you know, now, like, not even so much the logo, the first thing you need to nail is your brand guidelines. And your brand, brand guidelines will consist of a logo, color palette, and, and, and your fonts. Like, at the very, very least, have that. Because if you have that and you're confident in that and it resonates with your audience, then you can evolve and push out. I mean, if any of you... Do it, like, give me a little like if you remember my original logo. Do you remember the little shield that I had? I'm talking about the original one. Gal, you'll remember this. It was purple. Do any of you remember my, my burgundy logo that I had? Like, I don't even know if you can find it anymore, but I had this burgundy logo created and it looked dog shit. I hated it. And I, I sat down with a branding expert and I had a branding session on, it, uh, session on it and it was all about what my audience wanted. It was all about let's create this logo for your audience and it's, it, it represented all of the things that I wanted my audience. Uh, I fucking hated it. I hated it. I was embarrassed. I didn't like it. So I never ever pushed it. In fact, the moment I got it and it was designed, I, I rebuilt it. I turned the crest arms from the purple into the blue. I made them blue. I actually took out that middle section, which just looked horrible. I didn't like it at all. And I made it the world. And then I made, I put a little hat on it because I wanted to talk about education and online education. And that was what I was focusing on. So it was like the shield with the globe and the hat and the wing. It was still fucking crap, you know, but it got me through the first year of my business. It got me through the first actually two years, to be fair. So when I started out, I didn't have my brand guidelines. I didn't have a clue. But... It got me through, it got me to a place where people started to know me and I put it on videos and it was all over the place. Now, since I have my redesign and I've got my new logo now, I fucking love it. Like, I love what my whole business stands for. It resonates so well. Like, I, I'm so proud of what I've got. Like, my main font is Montserrat. My other font is Open Sands. That's it, different weights. I have a light Open Sands and I have Montserrat. My colors, as we know, are blue, green, and pink. Um, I've got my logo. I, like, it's done. All right, it might cost me a grand to do it, but I highly, highly recommend. Speak to Mark Hare, speak to Mark Doyle, um, speak to Tony Snow. He's a great guy. He knows some stuff. Me, I have a lot of different opinions on, on my business and websites, and I know what he's uh, promoting at the moment. But even though I don't agree with some of the strategies he's putting out in terms of his online business, I absolutely resonate with what he talks about when he talks about design and branding and marketing. His message He's a great guy. So Tony Snow, Mark Doyle, Mark Hare, some amazing people to reach out to. And then find some creative people. Just go and have a look around and see what creative people are doing. Like go on to some, like one of the first things I did when I was looking for designers, I went onto some designer Facebook groups. I started like going into these places, like go into, go in, type in uh, graphic design in Facebook. There's a Facebook group, like 20,000 designers in it and they're all talking about design ideas. And just having that pushed into your newsfeed every now and again gives you an awareness of something different. You know, people discuss different logos, different ideas, so you pick up on things. Go to technical colleges and look for an intern. Find someone who really wants to start, like, sink their teeth into a brand and get it out there. Because once you've nailed this, once you've got this, then you can start looking at your voice. Like, again, as I said, if you go to Roberta Stoll Lee on Instagram and you look, you'll see how her Instagram's set up. It's, it's branded in a very specific way. You go across to a YouTube channel, you go across to a Facebook page, you go across to a website. It all matches. That's the power of the brand is that everything matches. It's all consistent across every platform, every media. How you show up, whether you've got a roller banner at a live event or whether you've got a website or whether you've got your social media platform. Having that consistency and having someone that can come in and say, okay, I want this created. Here are my brand guidelines. You can give that to any designer and they can put their spin on it to give you what you need. Make sense? So brand, really, really important. Uh, nothing else, take that away. From design, just get your brand guidelines. Basic, basic level. When you're looking at design on a website, people get too carried away with things like being aesthetically pleasing. Um, when you consider the mediums of how things are put across, people can forgive something that doesn't look as good as it needs to look. People won't forgive a spelling mistake. 
There is absolutely no reason for you to have a spelling mistake. I'm crap at spelling. Like, I, prob I think this is probably one of the reasons that my wife divorced me because she's an English teacher and my spelling's so bad. Because the reality is, I rush. A lot of the times when I'm typing things, I rush or I miss keys and I spell, but I, I don't take the time to think. But I have Grammarly, I have autocorrect, I have things that help me to make sure my spelling's good. There's no excuse. If you want to see and be out there and be perceived as being an expert and being good at what you do, then you really need to understand who your market is. Like if you're trying to talk, you know, street to like teenagers, then you might have a different like message than if you're trying to talk to um, an old age pensioner, you know, it's going to be a very different style of message. But one of the things you need to understand is that the content that you write is important. Another thing that's inexcusable is audio. Audio has to be on point. When I record my podcast, it's done in a certain way. All my soundproof is going up today. So, um, phenomenal Stephanie there, and, and um, she's got a builder and they're doing some work on the wall. So, all of the walls getting covered, it's all going to have all the soundproofing on it. And so, it's really important to me from an audio perspective, because when we're talking about design, I'm not just talking about visually how it looks, but I'm talking about how you're designing your brand, how you're designing your business, how you're designing your lifestyle. Design covers so much more than just this. So, when you start to consider it from that point of view, if there is, if, if this is how I think about it in design, if I'm thinking about audio, I always imagine someone with their earphones in. So first thing I do is if everyone's testing audio, you can test it on your laptop, but put earphones in and ideally get good quality earphones. So you've got earphones in and you're listening. Is there anything in the sound that can distract people from the message they need to hear? Because if I'm sitting there listening to something and all I can hear in the background is something going <coughs> constantly in the background, I'm going to be like, ah! I'm not going to be listening to the message. So you need to make sure that if there's anything that is annoying or anything that doesn't sound like a hum or a huzz, huzz or a buzz, here's a pro tip for you with guiding audio. Anything that you use in terms of a microphone that plugs into USB, USB has uh, electrical current going through it. You will always get a hum. You'll always get electrical interference. Specifically, even when I'm using the Rode Podcaster, when I've got that set up, it's a USB condenser mic. So I still have to go in and post edit the audio to take out the hum. So you need to understand that. Now the reason I mention the audio side of it, it's unforgivable. Design is a little bit more forgiving, but you don't want to go out there looking off brand. You don't want to go out there looking bad. Like there was a, in fact, there was a lady called Ling. I don't know if you know Ling's cars. Google Ling's cars. Honestly, you will love it. If you do nothing else today, look at Ling's cars. So she has multiple, multiple design awards for the world's worst website. It is absolutely horrific. It is. It will make you feel sick. In fact, if you look at that and you, your eyes aren't bleeding afterwards, then you're, you're, well, you probably need help because it is. It's horrendous. The website is just. I, it, it scares me to look at it. I'm just seeing if I, my battery's died on my laptop. I was going to show you it. But Ling's cars. Now, strategically, she's done that for a very, very important reason. The reason she's done it is because it got so much attention at being so bad. She makes so much business out of it. She's a car salesman. They've all got this perception of being seen as, as, as who and how they are. And so it's kind of interesting when you consider um, sometimes bad design can be used in a way that actually helps you. Because she's actually taken a weakness. Like she wasn't very good at design. So what she did is decided, you know what, I'm going to strategically be bad in, in design. Because I'm not about design, I'm about selling cars. She's really good at selling cars, really bad at design. But used it to her advantage. See, the whole thing about design is you want to get something that people start talking about. If you're on your social media and you're designing something, let's say you've got your Instagram, you know, and you've got like a quote or something that's going out or whatever it may be, all this needs to be branded, it all needs to be aligned, it all needs to resonate and sit with people. So whatever your templates are, whatever your thumbnails are, whatever your cards are, you know, you've got your YouTube channel, if you're going to be using um, like thumbnail placeholders or anything like that, oh, sorry, I'm trying to get so you can see it all. Um, then you need to understand, like, what does this look like? You know, what does this look like? What does, how does it all fit together with your brand to get that consistency out there? The voice I've just mentioned, how you sound, how you come across, you know, do you want to come across as a really aggressive marketer? You know, someone who's like, you need to take action right now. You need to listen to me because I'm really masculine and I know what I'm talking about. Like, if I then sent you to a website that had really fancy, See nice scripty writing, and I'm sitting on a video going, yeah, yeah, guns and women, and you need to do this, rah, 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 and then you went here, and it was all like classical music, we were very like soft, like, can you see how there's an inconsistency, I'm, I'm, 
Of course I'm exaggerating, but can you see the difference? There needs to be consistency in whatever your voice is, with whatever your brand is, with whatever your design is, so that your designer can look at it all and say, okay, I see what you want. And that's really all I want to cover today, just to give you this awareness, nothing more. If you want to go deeper into this, read my book. It's all in my book. I've covered everything. All the things you need to do, how you need to do it, things that are important. There's also the color wheel and everything like that's in there. Talk about all the different colors. Um, but I hope this has helped. I hope you found it useful. I'm going to leave you here. Have an amazing weekend. Anybody you know, if you've got someone like, if you've got any examples of design, please let me know below because, um, in fact, just paste your logo in. Paste the logo and a link to your company and your business or a product or something. Because when you get into design, the one this is the one thing. If I can give you a takeaway from today, like a really important takeaway, it's important to have an awareness of this. But the most important thing that you need in a business, as a business owner, are brand assets. Digital assets that you can use. Product images, social media things that you can share, you know, hero images for your website. You only need a few, like you don't need a professionally designed landing page that costs two and a half thousand pounds to make sales. And there's a lot I can go into. In fact, there's so much I can talk about about how design can help or hinder conversions and how sometimes less design. Like I know designs that have cost fifty pound that have well well outperformed uh, websites that have cost two and a half thousand pounds. I'm talking about a landing page. I know landing pages, like some of the most successful landing pages don't cost a lot of money to build because they just, they get them out there. It's all about the contact, the structure, the flow, the strategy. That's stuff I do with my clients, to be fair. I'm not going to do that on a Facebook Live because I want to, you know, I want to keep some stuff from the people who are paying me. But the reality is if you get awareness of this, it's going to help. Do this, get that, this awareness, work on your voice, know who you are, know what you're doing, and from that point, start to get consistency across every platform. And remember that the most important part of what you're trying to sell is how that comes across. It's the packaging, it's the um, it's a digital product, it's however your digital asset is packaged up, that's what's important. All right. Don't get too caught up in the design, you don't have to go too deep into this. But just know that how you show up will attract who comes to you. So if you want decent quality clients, then you need to appear as a decent quality brand. Because if you show up like crap, you're going to attract crap. How do you address the common question, Steve? I want to make, uh, I want you to make me my site for free. I'll pay you after you make me money. What a great question. Let's end on this. I'm going to end on. I, I, I love that. I, for everyone else, that's it. Design's over. I mean, look, I had this conversation and I actually posted it on Facebook. So I had um, yesterday a potential client come to me and said, I would like you to, no, he said, I'm looking for somebody who can market my business. What's this, sorry, um, iron shirt and waistcoat. I'm learning lots, even with the sound down. <laughs> Tom, I miss you, man. I hope you're well, brother, I really do. Um, yeah, so going back to this point of yesterday was really interesting because um, this a friend of mine reached out to me and said, I'm looking for somebody who can do my marketing. He said, what I really want is somebody who can come into my business and who will um, pay for the ads themselves. So I want somebody to come into my business to pay for the ads themselves and to manage the whole ad campaign. And I will give them 50% of any deals that we do. Now, What's your opinion of that? What do you think of that? If I say that to you, what's your instant gut reaction? It's like, okay, yeah, like someone who has no money who's trying to get someone to get to make the money so that they can pay them. It's like instantly, it's like red flags all over the place, right? The reality is he's got an extremely successful company. You know, guy's a multimillionaire doing extremely well for himself and he, he's very successful at what he does. He just doesn't understand the marketing side of things and there's nothing wrong with that. That's totally fine. So I turned around and said, the problem with this, here's the problem. I said, and because he was a friend, you know, I sort of said, look, I'll give you some advice. I said, if you attract people like that, then they're not going to be very good because anybody who's good at what they do values their time and they charge accordingly. Like I know people that charge 20,000 a month just to run the campaigns. That's not including the ad budget. And to be fair, the guy that I was meant to be going and seeing this month, I'm not going out there at the moment, there's just too much going on with the clients and stuff I've got going on. But we are rearranging it and I am gonna be going out to spend a weekend with him. He at the moment manages $8 million a month in ad revenue on Facebook alone. He's, made, he's generating like 
40, 50 million a month in, in revenue for his clients. He's got some of the biggest clients out there. So when you consider, like if you tell, turn around to him and say, work for free and pay for the ads yourself and I'll give you, like he's gonna tell you no, but he gets great results. So the question is, do you want results or do you want someone who's just gonna come in, spin the wheels for three months and then you're gonna end up in the same position, if not a worse position, because they may have damaged your brand. They may have taken your brand, put it out into the world in their marketing campaign and made you look worse. And you may have actually damaged your brand. And you've also wasted time. Wasted. You haven't wasted any money because it did not cost you anything, but nothing's free. Right? What you don't pay for in money, you're going to pay for in time and energy and possibly other things as well. So I turned around and said, well, how about this? Rather than you giving me 50% of any deal and me putting my skin in the game, why don't you put your skin in the game, give me five grand, we'll use that as a starting budget and I'll only take 25% of any deal we make. So just by reframing that conversation, it led to another conversation. So he brought in a partner and we had a conversation and this guy was like, well, why are you so good? Why should I work with you? Why should we? And I turned around and said, look, I've got no dog in this fight. This isn't about me trying to convince you why you should work with me. I don't care if you work with me or not. Like, you're going to do fine. I'm going to do fine. If you want to work with me, I'm here. I'm not here trying to pitch and sell myself to you. I don't need to do that. I've got my clients. I'm happy with what I'm doing. I'm only giving you this advice because of a friend and I want to help you. So they were like, yeah, but we know that it's going to cost this amount for cost per click and this is how much money we need to spend um, on Google Ads. I was like, I won't even be touching Google Ads. Like, you're looking in the wrong direction. You want to be looking here. Like, on this form of social media marketing, because this is your audience. And I'm not going to go into it, but basically, I turned around and told them exactly why they need to be doing what they're not doing and how it's going to... Like, they're like, oh, but we're, we're already spending, like, five to 10000 a month and we're not getting results. I'm like, well, then it's not working, which is obviously why we're having this conversation. So what you need to do is you need to change your model. Change, like, you, you, don't, you don't understand. And that's fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with people not understanding. That's why people pay people like me so they can understand things and get it a different perspective on it, right? So the whole concept behind that is, look, I know what I'm worth. I'm not going to work for free. If you want something for free, like, I'll do this for free. This isn't work. This is, this is like contribution to me. This is my giving back. This is me helping people. It also helps me. This is brand awareness. This is getting new people in touch with me. Like, I've struggled. I've built myself up from nothing. I've been there where I'm like, please, please let me work for you. Please, please let me help. Please, please. And I can tell you now, like, if, if, if you can get anything from this, I was going through such a bad point at one time that I had a car but I've run out of petrol driving around the M25. Any of you know London, there's a motorway that runs around it, it's a circle, it's called the M25. I was driving around the M25, I ran out of petrol. I had to phone a very good friend of mine up, Anita Langley, and I was literally, I was in tears, crying to her saying, I am so skinned, I can't even put petrol in my car, and I needed to borrow 50 pound. She had to wire 50 pound from her PayPal account to mine so that I could get petrol. I just dropped my daughter off. Like, I hadn't eaten that weekend so that she could eat, and I dropped her off, and I got her home, and on the way back, I ran out of petrol, but I, I just didn't know where else to I was just praying, like, please, looking at the needle on empty, like, please, 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 please get me home. Now, the reason I share this story with you is because you can imagine the financial situation I was in at that time. You can see how difficult things were for me during that time. I had two emails on people saying, can you build me a website for £200 or £300? Can you build me a really cheap website? And Gal, Gal will tell you, because I was on my way back to Gal's. I was living with her at the time. Her and Skip, I was, I was living there. I was on my way back to I was, I was That's how bad it was. You know, I, I had no money. I was that skinned. And so my point is, when I was in that place, I had two emails because there was a couple of people who were saying, build me a website for two, three £300. And I'm looking there thinking, I'm so desperate for money. Like, I really need this money. I should take this work. Now, I know that they would have been a nightmare. I know that it would have looked crap. I know that they had no budget for design or anything else or content. They had no real mission. They just wanted a website. It was just a quick way to earn money, right? But I know that it would have taken me three to four weeks. There would have been a lot of back and forth. I would have spent so much time working on them and not making a lot of money out of that that I refused the work. I turned around because the, but that was the most powerful thing that I've ever done was turning around to someone who said, can you work for free? Can you work for cheap? And I just said, fuck off. Because when I did that and I said no, because I said it politely, but when I just said, fuck off, all of the crap went away because I set a new standard for myself. And I said, you know what? I'm not fucking settling for this shit work anymore. I'm going to, I don't know how, but I'm going to 
make an impact in a certain way. And if people haven't got money, then they're not my audience. That's not what's for me. As a result, because I'm a nice guy and I still want to help people, I still want to help people that don't have money. As a result, I wrote a book. Because I wanted to know how can I help people if they don't have the money, but I still want to help them. I can do a Facebook Live. I can write a book. I have an online course. I productize myself in a way that if you don't have money, I can still help you. But I just don't have to give you my one-on-one time. Because if you can't pay for my one-on-one time, then that's fine. But you need to understand that if, if, I'm, not, like, if I'm doing the work for you, you're going to pay for that. If, otherwise, you do the work. And so when someone comes up to you, and I, just to get back to this point and answer this question, I know I've sort of digressed, but I'm really, really glad, Chris. Thanks for asking it. Like, I want you to make my site for free, and I'll pay you afterwards. The only way I would do that, the only way I would do that, is if I believed, if I, like, in here, if I'm like, I truly believe in who you are as a person, what you are creating, I can see potential for what it is you're doing right now, because I have that right now. I'm, I'm going to let you know. I have a client that, are, that they're not paying me, but I have 5% equity in the business. I have 5% equity in the business and I'm sitting on the advisory board because the advisory board leverages me with some amazing people and 5% equity means I'm going to get my return. And I'm doing that because it's, I see value in what they're creating. I see value in the people who are running it. I believe they have a solid business model and I see value in what I can bring to the table and what they're going to get as a result of it. So if someone turns around to you and says, I want you to make my site for free, I would turn around and I would answer with this. I don't work for free. My rate is X, £1,000 a day, £100 a day, whatever it is for you. However, however, because if you work for free, there's no value in free. However, this is my rate. I am willing to, um, I'm trying to think of the right word. Ah, uh, uh, oh, Facebook Live and the word's gone. Help me out. What's the word? When you give something, but it's not for free, it's like, um, I'm thinking gratitude, but it's not the right word. Like, you know, I will do it like, oh, I can't think of the word. I won't charge you as in, I won't, you won't charge you up front. However, so let me start that again, because I can't think of the word I'm trying to think of. Like when you compliment something, like when you give something, it's not, you don't want to say it's for free. It's like, this is the price, but I'm not charging you for it. What's that called? My mind has literally just gone blank. Anyway, the, the point I'm trying to make is that you, you don't use the word free, because free devalues. So look, this is the price of it. I won't charge you up front. However, I want that payment once the site's built and I want stake and equity in the company. I want 5, 10, 20%, depending on how much hassle they're going to be. If I think someone's a nightmare, I want 50%. If I think I haven't got to do a lot of work and it's really easy, I want 20%. You know, it, it varies. Like it, and, and then looking at what the potential return is. How much time and energy do I have to invest? What's the potential risk? of it going wrong, how much time, energy, money can I waste, you know, what can I potentially get as a return from that, weigh it up, if it's a good decision then do it, but if someone says they want you to make the site for free, so I don't work for free, this is my rate and I'm happy to do it without you uh, putting any financial outlay up front, but these are the terms and conditions and you need to stick by them, and I would not hand the site over until you are happy, I would make sure it's on your server, I'd make sure you're building it, I'd make sure you're in complete control, you do not give them access until you have um, goods or services in the value of. I hope that helps because it's really, really important that you get that. Really, really important to get that. Oh, I didn't see all the comments on it. Uh, yeah, so it's like an investment. So, all right, guys, look, I hope that helps. I went on a bit of a tangent at the end there, but Chris, thanks for that question. I really, really appreciate it. But you get the idea, right? I hope this has helped. And now, because, oh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't finish off the story because I got sidetracked. I turned them. I told them clients I wouldn't work for them for the two three hundred that evening. That evening, because I didn't take on those two hundred pound jobs. That evening. Now, this could be law of attraction. This could be I don't know divine. Whatever you think, it may have just been really lucky. Whatever, I don't care because it happened. That evening, I had a job coming for a thousand pounds. It was an easy job, it was a great client, and I sat there, cried my fucking eyes out, and I was just like, shit, I can't believe it. It solved all of my initial problems that I had, and it got me to the point where I was a lot more confident and comfortable because of it. It happened because I had faith in myself. Now, I'm not saying that if you say no to everyone, shit's just going to land on your lap. But I do know that when you start saying no to people, that has real power. 
scarcity. One, you're not available. So you, you instantly, the moment you're not available, your worth goes up. You ever been in a relationship? Try chasing a woman. Stop chasing a woman, see what happens. Like it's every dynamic, it's not just business. Every dynamic in life. Right? If you're if you're if you want something, when you get it, you don't want it anymore. It's like that whole thing that if something's not available, you want it. And I, I think I told a story recently with the marketing where I was talking about the toy story at Christmas, about what the toys what the toys did about the toy shops where they would um, sell a product, make sure it wasn't available in the shops, and then in the new year they would sell it because it was scarcity. Scarcity is good. Scarcity is not a bad thing as long as scarcity is used in an ethical way. You can, you can, I can do like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a 20 minute coaching session. There's only one available. Who wants it? That's scarcity. I'm not doing it by the way, but I'm just using it as an example. That's scarcity because I only have one place. That's not me saying, Here's a digital product, and I'm only selling two of them. Yeah, stay oversubscribed. I'm, I'm not taking like. Here's the thing, right? I have a cut off. Like I'm like I'm not working with clients anymore. I am genuinely not working with clients anymore because I have all the clients I can work with at the moment. In fact, I sat downstairs this morning and I was like, I've got too many clients. I've got too many clients. Like my head is in like twelve different businesses at the moment, just from yesterday's conversations. Like, in fact, yesterday I had a day off for the first time in ages. I had the night off yesterday and. I was like, I've got two websites about to go live. I, I, I took like seven Ubers yesterday. I was like, I was all over the place. I was like from meeting to meeting to meeting. I took on a new client. I went for breakfast yesterday morning. And as a result, I didn't even think it was a business meeting. I went for breakfast with a friend. And as a result, picked up a new client because of it. I was on the DLR, picked up a new client just because of a conversation I had. Like I've now got two new clients and I'm already full up. Like, this isn't like fake scarcity, this is real. So now when people come to me, like the guy yesterday, do you remember when I said I was on a conversation and the guy was like, why should, like, why? and I'm like, I don't need your business. I'm giving you some advice. Take, I'm so attractive to that guy at the moment. Like that guy really wants to work with me because I'm like, I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just giving you some advice, use it, go away. Like make success from it. When you, when you get to that place, when you can confidently get to that place and you mean it because you're there for the right reasons, not because you're trying to bullshit people like pretending to be fake or pretending to be real, like, you know, doctoring like Photoshop things. Like, uh, I, 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 I saw a really interesting, like a lot of my friends were in um, uh, California at the moment. They're working on uh, internet marketing. So a lot of internet marketing people were at the internet marketing party last night. Ty Lopez was a speaker. Now Ty Lopez has po polarized his audience because there's a load of people who hate him and that think he's fake. But everybody who listened to him speak last night was like, actually, my perception of Ty has changed. Ty is a really good guy, he's really integral, and actually what he says makes a lot of sense. So it's very, very interesting how he did what he needed to do to get him on a platform, and now he's delivering his message. So you really, really need to understand that when you're putting yourself out there, how do you want to be perceived? Like your brand, your design, everything you do is the perception other people have of you. How do you want to be perceived? Because maybe you don't want to perceive as a nice guy. You know, there's a guy who's got a website called therichjerk.com and he's all about putting you down and making you feel bad. But as a result, he's got an audience, massive audience, you know? Like whippersnappers, young guys, people who are up and coming who want to make a name for themselves. Like, there's a lot of different people out there. Just find your tribe, find who you want to attract and make yourself, you know, make yourself desirable to them in a way that you're comfortable with. That's when you know you're in a good place. That's when shit starts to happen. I hope this helps. I hope you've had a good um, session with me. Sorry that it's run over longer than I wanted it to. I don't even know how long we've been going. Um, 48 minutes. Have a good weekend, guys. I'll speak to you soon. Take care. Thank you so much for all of your support. I am really, really grateful for it. You guys mean, I, I, I wouldn't be talking for this long if you weren't all still engaged. So the fact that you're all still on here and you're watching and listening to me, have an amazing weekend. I hope it helps. Can't wait till Monday, midday, we're going to start some brand new topics, go through some brand new stuff. And remember, if you want to catch up on anything I've spoken about, pop over to YouTube. I'll post a link below. Tag anyone that you think should hear about this. Um, love you guys so much. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate you all really do. But check it out on YouTube. I'll put all the videos up over the weekend so you can play back anything that resonates with you. Take care. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye.